here. Thank you for having me. So I did not prepare uh, a PowerPoint. I figure we're we're all on Zoom so often, so much. So um, I love to just see faces and, and interact. And so um, if if questions arise, if things come up, feel free to um, drop them in the chat or um, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. Um, this can be as interactive as you would like to make it. Um, so I'm just here to talk a little bit about um, what a year it has been for all of us. Um, thinking back to a little bit over a year ago when um, I became the 2021 um, State Teacher of the Year, it has been um, very humbling um, and it has been just a, a great honor. Um, I've learned so much. Um, I submitted, I think I've done about like like 70, 80 speaking engagements. So I've been doing that um, quite a bit, really talking about my platform, um, which is really about, um, it, it really models after after getting to know uh, Juliana Ertube, who is our National Teacher of the Year, but it's really what we can do to work together to create that just and joyful future for, for our young people. They deserve it all. And um, what are the ways that we can center healing? What are the ways that we can center joy in everything that we do? And what are the ways that we as um, the educators and policymakers and, and folks in leadership positions, how can we shift um, instead of asking our students and families to shift to what is uh, maybe comfortable or what is um, sort of easier for us? Um, Sonia Renee Taylor, and I'm gonna pull up her quote real quick because that is um, sort of what has um, centered me in all of this year. And I've started every presentation with this quote um, because I think it's so important. And it says, um, we will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends, we are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. And so that's really been my invitation in every space that I've been in this year um, with all sorts of folks, with students, with families, um, with policymakers, um, and really thinking about what is the way that we can work together to stitch that new garment, um, that one that fits all of humanity and nature. And so sort of like uh, when I talk with my own students in my class that um, teaching ethnic studies and English, that it's not um, any one person's fault or any one group's fault for where we are today, um, but collectively it is our responsibility to work together um, to create that new future. And so um, a little bit, I just got back from, uh, yes, I can definitely share that. Um, I can definitely share that. Uh, Mary. It's uh, by Sonia Renee Taylor, who wrote The Body is Not an Apology. Um, it's a great book on radical self-love. So wonderful, wonderful book. Um, so uh, sorry, I got distracted. Um, so uh, just came back from Washington, D.C., which was a great opportunity to really get a chance to get together um, with other state teachers of the year um, from around the country. And we had a really unique experience um, in for the first time ever in uh, State Teacher of the Year, I don't know, recognition, <laughs> the 2020s and 2021s were together. And so we had an opportunity um, to be with both groups um, and had an opportunity to go to the White House. Uh, we got to meet with um, Dr. Jill Biden, and we also got to hear from um, President Biden. We've gotten to hear um, a couple of times from uh, Secretary Cardona, I um, got a chance to spend some time with Becky Pringle, the president of the NEA, and some other folks that um, are really leading um, the way in um, uh, for our nation around educational issues. Um, I would say everything about this year um, was different for so many reasons. Um, I think COVID um, has really um, just kind of uh, brought to the surface the structural inequalities that exist within our system. Um, and I think everything uh, has been different. Every Zoom has been either from my living room with a curtain that runs down the center of it or um, in my new office. And so um, it also shifted in that um, I did not return to the classroom um, this fall. And so I, I took a new position in my district as our instructional equity specialist. And so I'm really working on um, infusing equity into our instructional practices and really thinking about 
um, restorative practices, really thinking about incorporating ethnic studies P through 12. We have a standalone class, but also thinking about the infusion of um, culturally responsive practices and other um, elements of ethnic studies um, P through 12. Um, really thinking about making sure um, STI and tribal curriculum in learning is happening um, P through 12, and also thinking about um, mindfulness practices and, and how we can do anti-racist um, social and trauma-informed social emotional learning. So that's sort of what I've been up to um, for the past year. Um, I don't know if there are any questions or, or anything that you'd like me to touch on that I didn't. Um, I just, I wanted to just kind of open the floor if, if folks had questions or, or things that I could answer. Okay, thank you, Brooke. Uh, the floor is open. Paul, go ahead. I took the opportunity to jump in here. Uh, how, how you doing, Brooke? It's great to be with you here today. Um, hey, I, I have a question. So you mentioned ethnic studies and uh, that's something that we're working on. Um, something we're really interested in. What are your thoughts on, on um, our implementation of it, our work with it, the kind of needs that um, teachers and, and schools have? Um, any, any insight you can give us? Yeah, that's a, how much time do you have, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We might have to talk offline. Yeah, but yeah. we can definitely talk offline. Um, I was one of the co-facilitators with um, uh, Denisha Salcedo and um, Vero with, on the Ethnic Studies Advisory Committee um, with OSPI. And um, as a ethnic studies, um, I have an ethnic studies degree from the University of Washington. And as someone who, um, I credit ethnic studies with um, changing my life. Um, you know, I, I went to, I had great experience K through 12. I had phenomenal teachers, um, but I'm, I identify as a biracial black woman. And honestly, I just didn't read a lot about um, people that looked like me and, and had similar experiences. So I remember um, ethnic studies. I remember my professor where we read their eyes were watching God and it just changed my whole outlook on learning. Um, my 14 year old's daughter is named Zora after the late great Zora Neale Hurston. And so um, I think there's a lot of different aspects of ethnic studies that we have to consider uh, when we think about um, institutionalizing it. I think um, part of um, ethnic studies is the students are really the curriculum. And so I think um, if we have the discussion around um, curriculum. It just starts to get um, it starts to get tricky because um, it, it depends. It depends on the community that you teach in. It depends on the students that you have. And so, honestly, um, just like the report that came out, uh, the most important thing that we can do is is professional development. And um, the most important thing we can do is have educators that are willing to continue um, to learn. I call myself an aspiring anti-racist ethnic studies practitioner because I'm never going to arrive. And so my goal is just to be better than I was yesterday. And so I think um, that requires us to be, um, what podcasts are we listening to? What are we reading? What are we, what does our Amazon orders, if you know, our, our bookstore orders look like um, with, how are we continuing to remain um, remain um, current in the practice? How is it connected to what's happening in the world and what's happening in our in our own community? And so I don't know if that answers your question, but no, that that's that's fantastic. And just a quick follow up to that: Do you have a community of educators that you can communicate with and get ideas from, or is that something that would be helpful? Absolutely. And so I think if there's um, one of the best gifts, or I would say the best gift, it was really, um, it was quite an experience. I saw someone put in the chat um, my interview with Bill Gates and, you know, we got, I got a selfie with, um, with Joe Biden and, you know, those are, are great experiences. Um, but honestly, the absolute best experience that I got to have this year has been the relationships that I've made that will endure far past um, this year. Uh, and I think that is the, the number one thing about ethnic studies is it has to be done in community. Um, it has to be done with students. It has to be done um, with educators that are um, that have a critical lens, that um, are utilizing praxis, that are continuing to stay current, um, and are connected with with parents and families. And so I think that's really um, 
it would be, I, I don't think we could do ethnic studies uh, in a vacuum or on an individual basis. And so um, I think it's by the community for the community with the community. And so I think those are really important things to think about as we um, think about implementing ethnic studies. That's excellent. And, and you know what I, I, I have heard from uh, some, some teachers who are immersed in ethnic studies, you know, that they, they need more community they need more support and and uh, and and just that ability to to communicate and and uh, as you mentioned, you know, continue that learning. Sounds like you've got some really good friends. You made some really good friends. I did, yeah, and I'd be happy to connect with you further if you want to talk more about ethnic studies or sort of some ideas for how we can build that out. I think the legislature hopefully is going to be funding some more opportunities around ethnic studies for professional development um, and, and thinking about ways that as a state we can support communities um, maybe that aren't as far along in the work but would like to be and, and just how um, we can do that and support each that'd other. That'd be great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, just go ahead and hop in if you have a question. I don't really need to acknowledge people in a formal way. If you're ready, just ask away. <clears throat> so I'd like to build on what uh, Paul was asking about. You're talking about teachers and so on. Now you've moved into a different role, if you will. You've moved from the classroom to um, instructional, uh, can't remember the exact title, but, but it speaks administrator to me or central office, that kind of thing. I wonder if you have some thoughts about, because now you're, we're really talking about system impacts and this is a different role and so on. And <clears throat> I think uh, when we look at other kinds of changes, innovations, whatever term you want to use when you're trying to make, make change, the role of those people who sit adjacent to the classroom, impact the classroom and so on, um, can be pretty critical in terms of the kinds of support. So how, as you think about your role, uh, um, what kinds of advice or key things do you think need to happen at that level to further support the community you talked about, um, et cetera, so that it becomes the way we do things, not, not sort of the innovation we're talking about now, if, you, if I'm saying that correctly. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm learning in this new role, besides that I'm, I miss my students um, so very much. Uh, they're the why, right? I just can't um, talk about how much um, they are. They deserve everything. Um, I also think about, uh, you know, going to Washington last week or two weeks ago. I don't know, every time so. <laughs> I never know what day it is. Um, I had, I struggled being there. Um, I struggled um, even sometimes talking about it um, because I feel really conflicted being at a place where we're celebrating excellent educators in a place where in a time when so many educators are struggling. Um, so many educators are June tired in October or November now. And um, I really had a hard time. And uh, my mentor, Erin um, Jones uh, came with me. She's been my mentor since, I was in middle school and um, we actually hopped on a Zoom with Chris Emden, if you're familiar with him, but he gave me some really great advice. And he said, we don't need you to be June tired for them. They don't need you to be tired for them. What they need you to do is to rest and then get back to work. They need you to do things on behalf of them. And I, one of the things I've really found out is um, I would have classified myself as an expert teacher over the past 15 years. I grew into that. No, not perfect, not having all the answers, but I was pretty good at my craft. I'm no longer an expert in the field of teaching because I'm not in the classroom. And so I think it's really important that for us that are teachers on special assignment or instructional coaches or administrators, that we are not the experts. And so what does that mean to really create space at the table um, for teachers? What does that mean to solicit feedback from educators and then act on it? I think a lot of times we get feedback and um, 
we sit on it or we're not quite sure how to move. And I really think that our, the answers lie within our educators, within our students and within the families. And early on in my career, I used to think I knew what was best for my students. And I think the longer I, I was a teacher, I really realized that it, was, it wasn't my goal to, uh, it wasn't my responsibility or, or my goal or anything to have all the answers or to know everything. It was simply my job to show up, to love my students, to provide um, opportunities to remove barriers for them to reach the goals that they have for themselves. I was more of a chaperone than I was um, the, the carrier of knowledge. And so I think the more that we can um, bring folks to the table, um, I got a chance to meet with um, some of our senators and representatives um, in Washington and really thinking about what, it, what would it look like to humanize this profession? What would it really look like to, to listen to educators, to listen to students? Um, every semester I would ask uh, my students for feedback. That was sort of their summative um, final reflection that they had to do. And um, partly on the curriculum that I taught, partly on how I taught, partly on just the course as a whole. And then um, I would have them give advice to future students. And then I would share that advice with the next group of students, um, sort of this intergenerational um, uh, loop with kids. But I can tell you there's never been a semester that I didn't cry over that feedback. There's never been a semester that I didn't feel like I let somebody down. And so, um, and, and some people might say, well, uh, you're gonna let people down, you're not perfect. And yes, and that's not good enough to me. And so I really want to make sure that I'm trying my best to reach every kid every day. And um, I think we need to have that same stance in that, um, you know, we've had, there are educators that are walking off the job left and right across the state, across the country, because they're exhausted, because they feel unsupported. Um, and, and that trickles down to our students. And so I think we're, we're really in a crisis situation right now. And I think it's really um, an opportunity for us to stitch that new garment, for us to really rethink, reimagine, and reframe what education can be and how it can fit every student. I heard someone, uh, one of my colleagues uh, said, you either have a, um, a purple heart or a pilot mentality. And it's really this idea of, um, you know, if we get 85% through or 90% or through, then we're good. Um, but the pilot seeks to get everybody there safely. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm um, disciplined in hope. And uh, like Miriam Kava says, and, and just really trying my best every day to listen to what our educators need um, to show up and, and to serve. And if you could see behind me, I have a, um, a whiteboard with about... Um, 20 projects that I'm currently trying to do. And, and so the goal every day is what's, uh, what's for Monday and what's for someday? What, it, what is it that's urgent that we need to handle right now? What is it that we need to be um, consistently reimagining systemically how we can respond to these needs? And so um, that's really where the wisdom comes in is really thinking about what is it? And I think those are the questions we need to keep asking um, our staff, asking uh, the folks that are that are doing the magic, that are creating the magic in their classrooms. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. It that did. was kind of long, sorry. No, no, that's great. <laughs> I, you know, I love to, I love the notion of listening for one thing. I miss that. Listening and acting in ways that are supportive, enabling. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, of course. Brooke, this is Patty Wood. I, I just wanted to say thank you. Listening to your replies to Paul and and Jeff, what I'm hearing you say is that we need to remember to hold ourselves accountable, our own actions, challenge ourselves as adults, as leaders, as as citizens in this country in just our routine and every day. And whether that's like the choices I make when I select media or books or how I hold myself in front of kids, we we can't, we can't, we, can't, we, are, we are always looking to help others and we need to stop and make sure that we're living the role that we're trying to espouse. And that's a, always a good reminder. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. It's that embodiment, right? And I really, I took a class on critical mind or mindfulness for critical educators this last um, spring. And, you know, you're like, teacher of the year, doing lots of stuff, just take a college course, right? Seemed like a good idea. Um, but it was really powerful to really think about what does it look like to really lean into presence and really think about, um, you know, I've, I've heard mindfulness sort of weaponized as sort of making us, um, helping students to modify their behavior 
or helping us to become less stressed to become more productive. But what would it look like to just really lean into being and just fully um, present in the moment with one another and just recognizing the sacred time that we have together that we're never going to get again and and how that just helps us to show up differently um, and and just how that helps us to connect and appreciate one another even more and i'm listening to all my relations podcasts right now and it's uh, amazing if you haven't heard adrian keen and matika wilbur they're awesome i'm super late it's been out since like 2019 but um definitely a, a podcast worth listening to Thanks. I'll add it to my lengthening list. My <laughs> nightstand is not big enough to hold all my stuff right now. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Brooke. This is Jan. Hey. Um, your personality is effervescent. It comes from deep within you. I am not surprised that you are serving like you are. Um, you. Yeah, it's a privilege to have this time with you. I was thinking about what happened, something that occurred in a public comment yesterday, and I'd love your wisdom and sensitivity to it. It's kind of a, a perfect example. How might our ethnic studies work with two public comments we have from two very brave students that came on, and they are from a Jewish background, and they're feeling uh, more than marginalized in their schools, and they're very brave. To share that with the state board, I, I'm, I'm kind of struck by, by their honesty. And I thought, how would, um, I mean, I have ideas of what I might do, but with your training and your perspective of ethnic studies and also your own professional heart, how might you work with that school or those students, either as a consultant or if you were in the school, what, what are some steps you might take to help those that ethnic study, when you said, all the kids, you know, that whole sense of, of warmth and unity and understanding. What can you give us a, some ideas on that? Yeah, um, I think the biggest thing, first of all, thank you for that um, nice compliment and the um, and the great question. Um, I can only be me, right? And so um, let me see, I'm trying to look at this. Grab this resource. I think this right here. Just. Looks like we're going to get a real answer here. <laughs> we have to write this down. Um, well, I just want to. I like to make sure that um, I say things correctly, especially because I know this this is being recorded. So, um, so I think um, something that's really important when we think about ethnic studies and when we think about talking about. Um, you know, the work that we're doing. Uh, and a lot of times it gets labeled as divisive, but that's really the antithesis to what the work is. The work is about, it's rooted in critical love and it's rooted in centering humanity, healing and, and futurity and joy. And so whenever I um, hear students feeling um, on the margins, um, I start, uh, so by nature, there's a great article like the my role in the social change ecosystem. So probably because I'm biracial, um, I'm a bridge builder. And so um, whenever I hear students um, feeling on the margins, I feel like, okay, we got to get to work. What, what can we do to, to meet those students where they are? What, what needs are not being met? And so um, what, I, what I would challenge or invite, invite is a better word to think about, um, is for folks to start thinking about what is, um, what is the difference between dignity and respect? What does belonging really mean? And what are the universal truths about every single person? So um, David Castro at Amplify RJ does a lot of great trainings around um, restorative practices. Uh, but I recently got this book um, called Circle Forward. Um, and so I'm thinking about restorative practices. So those students are mitigating some harm that has been done. And so when we think about how do we support students who feel harmed, um, we start to think about, you know, what what is causing the harm and then how can we address that and so um, to me in the classroom setting or in the school setting it would be about really um, centering what we believe what are our values about one another and so um, in this resource they talk about these seven core assumptions the first one is that the true self in everyone is good wise and powerful the world is profoundly interconnected 
all human beings have a deep desire to be in a good relationship. All humans have gifts and everyone is needed for what they bring. Everything we need to make positive change is already here. Human beings are holistic and we need practices to build habits of living from the core self. And so um, if we're able to shift culture and really help our students to understand that there's no throwaway people, that everyone has everything that they need when they come into this space um, and that everyone is needed. Um, and, and that really comes from um, ancestral indigenous ways of being together and that, you know, when we were in smaller groups that you couldn't throw people out. Everyone was required. Everyone was necessary. And so we've gotten away from that in our um, in the, our ways of knowing and being together. And so it's a continual um, call back to ourselves. And so it's an invitation for folks to be in relationship with one another. And when we're feeling on the outside, when we feel like we don't belong, that's just, um, we've got to really revisit um, our core assumptions about ourselves and one another. And I can drop that resource in there if you That if would be interested. great, please do. And I just hope that we can refer your wonderful words to these two students, because yeah. I would feel um, Thank you. I think if that's the core of our work, then that's really uh, freeing. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if something's going on with my computer, so I'll have to, I'm not sure. I can't get that resource. You'll have to give me a minute. <laughs> I see your hand up, Mary. Yeah, no, you're multitasking. I'll, um, I'll preface, while you're looking for that, I'll just preface this with your, um, your comment about being present and mindfulness was, um, this to me is where we can learn so much from other cultures and, you know, the value of community and the individual and um, in the country I lived in, um, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer, when you do the greeting sequence, it was um, Senegal, it's in West Africa, and this is <clears throat> very common greeting sequence in the different languages, but it's the same concepts that came through. And I always love the literal translation of, um, you know, the response to, you know, how are you? And the I'm fine that we say, the literal translation in Wolof is I am here only. And it was such a beautiful way of saying, everything else isn't mattering. I am present, I'm here only, and having this conversation with you. And um, I love to, carry that um, because it's such a wonderful way of being, you know, and that being fully present. So, um, but my, my question, um, and I'm so glad you're starting to touch on this because it's this, this holistic thing that we started to talk about a little bit, um, a, a book that we share a, a love for, the um, Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity. Um, and I was wondering if you would be willing to share just a little bit with the board about, um, that you started to touch on it in your response to Jan, um, but that's been such a transformative book for me too. When I'm looking at whole child and well-being and um, seeing each other, um, love to hear your thoughts about it since we haven't been able to have that thorough conversation about it. <laughs> yeah, um, thank you for that reminder. Um, yeah, and I was just reading, uh, I started listening to Mark Brackett's Permission to Feel and just thinking about how, that's like the biggest lie, right? Is I'm fine. And what does it look like to create spaces where folks can um, authentically show up and that we can actually take the time to care and to listen um, to how they are doing? Um, yeah, so Belonging Through a Culture of Dignity is a great resource. I think one of the best um, things from that section um, or from that book is, is really thinking about um, dignity and respect. And so, yes, we need to respect our students, um, but really we need to recognize their dignity. And dignity is something that um, you can't uh, that can't be taken away. It's something that you're you're born with, that's inherent in your humanity, and that every student deserves um, to have their dignity recognized, and that they deserve to feel um, like they belong. And so I think one of the, the takeaways from that is really thinking about, um, it's not up to us as educators or leaders to define what belonging looks like. And, and really it's, it's up to us to build those relationships to be able to understand from our students' perspectives. And I would say even 
from for our colleagues' perspectives. Um, I can tell you in leadership positions um, for our colleagues of color, it's it's often very lonely situations. And so what does it look like um, for the burden not to be on our teachers of color or our leaders of color to retain themselves? Um, what does it look like to create um, uh, places where um, almost, um, what's the way I could describe it? So my nine-year-old wants to be a teacher and I struggle with it because um, does teaching deserve her? I don't know, right? Have we created systems that really support and um, will they really recognize her brilliance in every setting or will she just be burned out? You know, and that's part of what um, I think about. I view every new teacher. I do a lot with our best mentoring. Um, we're actually just, I'm Literally, while we were talking at the beginning, I was making uh, name tags because we're um, putting together bags for all our new teachers and inviting them um, for our new teachers of color to um, just a drop in session for a place to just be and get support and and be loved on. And so, um, you know, really, what are we doing to show up to support um, and how are we intentionally doing that and, and not waiting for, um, you know, uh, Bob and Crown Apple talk about this. Uh, cycle of um, the ineffective cycle of equity, right? And you're waiting for the circumstance that creates a need. What if we didn't wait for that? What if we just said we recognize the inherent dignity? And so we're going to shift the system um, to make sure that um, there's no barriers to what you can accomplish and where you can go. And our beliefs in, in that inherent dignity show up in everything that we do. Um, there's a quote here that I actually was just uh, used in a training um, that um, I've been delivering on equity and it's from page 106 and it says the culture of dignity provides the conditions for successful implementation of equity initiatives and pedagogies. Professor and social activist Bell Hooks reminds us, reminds us that teaching in a manner that respects and cares for the souls of our students is essential if we are to provide the necessary conditions where learning can most deeply and intimately begin. Therefore, in the absence of schools and classroom cultures that honor the dignity of every student, any attempt to be culturally responsive will be impossible. So really thinking about, we can, we can do these great initiatives, we can um, call them lots of different things, but until we really recognize the dignity um, of every single student and their inherent um, right to feel like they belong in every space um, and we're shifting the 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 climate or, or the atmosphere in those spaces to do that um, we're not doing the the work that needs to be done thank you yes paul She has a board book called Happy to be Nappy that my kids can read. Uh, they don't even need to read it. We've read it so many times that um, just made it talking about um, our hair and, and how um, Bell Hooks just has a way to, to make you feel so proud. Yes, I love that book and I love her. A really good person too. I'll, if, if, I'll, I'll throw one more out here. Um, if you were on the state board, Brooke, what would be the things that you would want to be focusing on? Hmm. That's a really great question. Um, honestly, there are so many things um, <laughs> I know envy the, all the things <laughs> to think about. Um, I, I just really think about, um, you know, what is it, what would it mean to humanize education for everyone involved? And so to me that, that, um, those are things like, um, do all of our students have access to mental health services? How are we, um, making sure that's a priority. Um, what about um, things like 
Wi-Fi for all of our kids. I know um, down the I-5 corridor, that's not as big of an issue, but is that something that um, every student has access to having their, um, their just the, the basics, right? To food, to, to housing, to um, technology, the things that we realized um, during COVID that every student um, needed or that was uh, made clear before, we all knew that before COVID, but just made a much more clear. Um, I would also think about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm not an expert at that because I'm not in the classroom right now. So I'm, I'm speculating a little bit, um, but I also wonder, um, you know, talking with other teachers from other states, I've definitely um, learned a lot about um, sort of where we are um, as a state, um, as compared to to other states and and hearing other things that are happening um, i think there's a lot of great ideas that um, and this is something that i echo to our senators and to our representatives like i think there's a lot of great ideas that get discussed um, but when the policies end up coming down um, there's unintentional harm that happens um, or unintentional i wouldn't even say harm i would say unintentional um, results um, that happen because um, folks that are not um, in the classroom are making decisions. So inherently there's um, just things that aren't thought about. And so there's lots of different things I could go on for a long time about, um, but I won't bore you. But I, I just really think um, if there was any one thing I would do, it would be to make sure um, that we're consistently talking to teachers and families and it would also be um, sort of how UDL is, um, meeting every student's need, the universal design for learning um, with flexible means. And so I think if anything, one of the things the pandemic has shown us is that there's a lot of different ways to be a great teacher. And there's a lot of different ways that a student can learn. And so what are we doing to create different pathways for students to reach them, their goal? And so I think we've really learned that the one size fits all approach isn't working for everyone. And so how are we being responsive to that as a system? I just wanted to thank you for your words today and for taking the time to be here, Brooke. It's really great to hear from you. My pleasure, thank you for having me. This is kind of a general question, but um, how are how are what is your sense of how teachers are doing now that we're back from the pandemic and and that type of thing? That's a great question. Um, they're exhausted. Um, I uh, one of the things about my job that I made very clear is that I wanted to be able to um, continue to be involved with students and in the classroom. So I'm doing um, quite a few different. Uh, projects that I could connect with you later if you're interested, looking at um, culturally uh, sustaining practices. I have an anti-racist mirror tool um, that I created that we're currently in the kind of second pilot stage and working with Dr. Stembridge um, to roll that out in a, um, in a deeper way. Um, and, uh, but one of my good friends who's uh, a way better teacher than I am, you know, I just, I, I just saw her yesterday and just this, walked into her classroom and she burst into tears and just, you know, the overwhelmedness um, and, and talking to her and, and just hearing, you know, she's like, I haven't had a planning period in three days. And we just went switched to a four by four schedule. So there's 80 minute class periods. So um, that means in a full work day, you've had like three, five minute passing periods in a lunch. Um, you know, that's really challenging. And then um, to be teaching with a mask on and, you know, um, there's a, a extreme shortage of subs. And so even when you're feeling so exhausted, like she was, um, she was like, I can't take a, I can't take a day off because I know what it will do to my colleagues. And I can't rest if I do that. And my students need me. And so um, I just think there's a lot. And then um, a lot of times the response is, well, 
you just need self care and it's so far beyond um, self care it's absolutely about what is um, Jeff Duncan Andrade talks about um, community centered wellness and it's really this idea that. Um, if I'm well, but Paul is unwell, then collectively we're unwell. And so those are muscles that we teach in our students. Um, but those are things our, I think our system really needs to understand that honestly, if our teachers are unwell, they are unable to care for our students in the way that they need to be cared for. There's been a huge uptick in um, suicidal ideations. Um, mental health is a huge issue. So when I'm working with teachers, I, you know, I, one of the things I just did in my classroom every day is that I would have a check in of just how are you, you know, like, and so noticing patterns in kids, if a kid's usually a five and today they're a one, like, I need to make sure I'm connecting with that kid every day. And so um, school counselors don't have enough time to do that. And so, um, and, and really thinking about these are, these are kids, these are legacies. You know, when I look at my students, I always think about um, teaching their great grandchildren, right? What opportunities am I providing them? And it just helps me show up a little bit of a different way. And so um, teachers are burnt out, teachers are exhausted. I'm very, very concerned that we're gonna see a mass exodus of teachers that make it through the school year. I know teachers are walking off the job left and right because, and it has nothing to do with how much they care for their students. Um, and I would even go as far to say is it really isn't about um, if they care for themselves or not. It's a matter of survival that that teachers are, are hitting their breaking points. And I really think um, we need to we got to figure out some ways to some tangible, real ways to really take things off teachers plates. What can we do to prioritize and really let teachers know we see you, we hear you, we care about you, and um, we want to partner with you because um, chocolate and coffee cards and, you know, those things are, they need time. Um, and I would even say it's not even about um, more money, it's about time. They need time given back to them and they need things taken off their plate. Uh, thank you for that. That that was that's really insightful. And you know, I you know the reason why I asked is that I I heard that um, and then this was from a group of BIPOC teachers. I'd heard that um, when they got back, they were hit with testing, and that it was just kind of demoralizing, you know, to come back after all that we've been through with COVID nineteen and then get hit with testing. Um, now, on the other end, I've heard from a superintendent who said that, you know, I'm just allowing my teachers time to just re, um, uh, re engage with students, just get that to re engage. You know. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for that insight. That's, that's really important. Yeah, I, I think we also have to remember when we're talking about mindfulness and when we're talking about, um, you know, dealing with trauma, our, our teachers are dealing with trauma, our students are dealing with trauma. So our administrators, I do not envy the job that administrators have to do right now. So no one's getting out of this without um, experiencing trauma. And I would just, um, I often remind folks that, um, you know, when like our physiological response to trauma is to revert back to our reptilian brain, right? It's to revert, it's that um, fight or flight. And so unfortunately what's happening is even if we're in places where we have a restorative focus, we are, um, folks are reverting back to um, what wasn't working before. And so, and, and that's really that invitation of stitching that new garment that fits all of humanity and nature, reimagining. Um, Dr. Stembridge is working on a book called The Art of Culturally Responsive Education. And I love that idea because even in medicine, the most scientific field there is, they call it practicing medicine. So I think we need to really reframe that and really think about education in the same way and that we are practicing um, and, and really um, thinking about prioritizing creativity, prioritizing innovation, prioritizing trying things, making mistakes and you know, um, letting go of perfectionism, letting go of um, when things aren't serving all of our students, um, that we go back to the drawing board. And, and that takes um, trust, um, that takes um, uh, thinking about different um, professional skills 
Um, and it, it's really, yeah, I just think we really have to reimagine together um, the way forward because what we're doing right now isn't working for everyone. Paul, I would just tag on to that just a little bit. You know, I think, you know, Brooke, you said, um, you know, our response is flight or fight. And I would add a third one that almost seems worse to me, which is just disassociation, right? You just kind of go numb. And, and I feel like um, that's what I see around me. I, I was that teacher, my principal asked me last week, how are you doing, Holly? And I burst into tears, you know, and I'm not. I'm not a crier <laughs> and I, I feel and it, it comes from just that deep disappointment in myself like I can't get traction, you know, but I mean if you can imagine it's like. There's this initial feeling of yay we're back in person, you know, like yeah there's the pandemic, but we can just kind of set that on the side because we're back let's go 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 and there's learning loss and we got to catch up for learning loss and let's test and find out what the learning loss is and. Then we're going to get everybody caught up because next year is going to be normal again, you know, and and then you're you're faced with like so on one hand there's like this buzz around you like we're just back. And in the meantime, our pandemic numbers are worse than ever and you're trying to you know you've got your air filters going and i've never seen my kids faces before. I walk my kids around the track a lap at the beginning of every period and I make them take their mask off just so I would recognize them on the street. They look totally different and I can't hear them. You know, I'd say 50% of the time when a kid responds, I have to ask them three times to say it again. You know, I, I lose my voice by second period shouting through my mask. Um, and any given time, I may have a third of my kids absent and then next week it's a different third of my kids absent and I'm trying to catch them up. I mean, so it's like we're, like on one hand, the conversation around what's happening is we're just back, go, go, go. And on the other hand, we're totally in the middle of a pandemic. And it's just such a bizarre cognitive disconnect. And, and you, there is no possible way to achieve normal, you know, what was perceived as normal, whether it was working or not, you know, everybody just wanted to get back to normal. Um, and yet there's this continuous, like, we're, you know, normal, normal. And I, and I think that's the most exhausting thing of all, you know, like, um, you know, out, out of one side of our mouths, we say the expectation is just to meet our kids at the door, meet them where they're at, just love them, let's just get everybody back in the fold. And on the other hand, the expectation is to just return to normal, go, go, go. And by the way, catch up for the last two years. And I, I feel, I, I really feel fear that next year, you know, we're going to think, oh, we've had a year of normal. Now we're really back to normal. And I think we're going to see some of the biggest mental health effects next year, honestly. And, and, and because it's all going to catch up to us, right? The reality is going to catch up to us. The kids that don't have credits, Chris talked about that this morning. I mean, you've heard me talking about that for a year, right? Like I said, we have to have waivers again this year. Well, I'm looking down the road at next year and I'm like, well, next year may actually be the worst because it all comes home to roost. And so teachers in the middle of that, I mean, you're just like, um, I don't know, you just can't get traction. You're just like plankton, you know, <laughs> that's what it feels like. And in the meantime, you're, you know, trying to help your students. So I think there's a lot of teachers that, you know, have suffered their own trauma in this, but then there's also that secondary trauma. And it's, um, and it's not the same kids all the time. You know, it's not your little pocket of kids that you just really need to put a warm blanket around. It's this pocket today and another pocket tomorrow and another pocket next week. Um, it just feels impossible. <laughs> so anyway, that's, you know, and I look around me and I mean, I don't, I don't identify any colleague that's doing fine. Not a single one, not my principals, not my co-teachers, you know, and that's just hard. <laughs> So, thank you so much for that brave response and um, just that honesty, because I think that's what we need more of. We need more um, because what's happening is when folks are speaking up, they're getting in trouble. And, you know, we've got to, it's almost like we're pretending like we're back to normal. And anyone that's not acknowledging that is, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. But I just think the more honest we are, the more realistic we are, the more that we can be present to what our students need and, um, and trusting teachers as professionals to know 
and to be present to our students' needs, I think that's, a, that's also a huge issue. Thank you for sharing. Well, this has been great. I would add to that last piece of the conversation that um, our kids are, are uh, they're, they, they have a really strong uh, genuine obiter, right? They know when we're being genuine and they know when we're trying to fake it to make it as it were. Um, and so if, if our teachers are going through what they're going through, our kids know that. Our kids sense that, they feel that. Um, they feel that we're trying to struggle just to make it through the day just like they are. Um, so if we're gonna be real, just like Holly was saying, um, and you're saying, Brooke, you know, we, we can try to fake it, but our kids are gonna know. They're, they're gonna figure it out pretty quick. So if they don't know already. Um, so we need to be genuine for our kids. And sometimes that can be looked down on. Um, by others in, in our profession, but you know, it doesn't change the fact that our kids have it, have it figured out. So anyway, Kevin, I saw your hand, sorry. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to, uh, to Brooke um, for all that you do for our students and, um, and uh, it's really great to read about you as well. <laughs> as you were talking, I was reading at the same time. Um, and uh, and um, are there, you know, other things that the community at large can do for do for teachers, whether it's businesses, whether it is um, parents, just the community, churches, you know, just sort of the community that both of teachers, you know, teachers and students don't exist in a vacuum, right? They, you know, if there is one thing you can ask of them, what what would that be? I think uh, that's a great question, and thank you for your uh, your kind words. Um, I think it's authentic partnership. It's building community together. I think um, I can't speak for all teachers. I can only speak for myself, but there are students that I would worry about when they weren't at school, when I didn't know how they were doing. So if I knew that um, community partners were able to help fund um, counseling sessions for students that aren't, didn't have access to it, or if I knew that um, my students uh, we're eating every weekend, you know, um, we have a great um, backpack for kids program that a lot of our students utilize. Um, we have a clothing closet and a hygiene closet that, you know, runs low sometimes. And so um, meeting our students, um, their physical needs, their emotional needs, their mental needs. And I would say just um, building those relationships because um, when our students feel valued by their community, when they see community members there, um, maybe it's um, volunteering, maybe it's um, helping support different programs, um, maybe it's um, being guest speakers or just building relationships with the schools, um, I think is huge because what that conveys to our students is that they matter, that people in the community care about them, that care about their success. And that helps them to show up differently, knowing that um, knowing that what they do matters to the folks there. And, and I think that's our, our way forward is that um, we all need each other. You know, we need one another. And um, the more that um, we feel like we're doing this work together, um, the more we can do. I have a, a wise colleague that says, if it feels heavy, it means we, we're not supposed to do it alone. And so I think right now, a lot of people feel really alone for a lot of different reasons. Um, and the more that we can just continue to show up for each other, um, I think will we'll help us uh, move forward. So the other thing I would ask, I think teachers would ask for, and just, and, and principals and superintendents is patience. Um, you know, understanding that it's not going to be flip a switch. You know, I think the impacts of this pandemic are, um, they, they run deep. Um, and, and it's not going to be, now we're back to normal. 
for a while. And the, you know, and the more that those, um, the more that we can allow time and allow the whole system to engage rather than thinking it's just going to happen in one spot, you know, K-12, whatever. Um, yeah, just patience. So. Yeah, that's a great point. That's what I'd ask for. Yeah. And I think <laughs> that is really demonstrated in relationship, right? So as we're in relationship with one another, we start to understand what those needs are. And um, yeah, I think patience is a huge one. I would also add accountability. I think um, we also need, um, I think accountability is a word that is overused and also has a negative connotation. Um, but I am a better person because people I care about have held me accountable because my students have held me accountable um, to be the best teacher that I can be. And I consistently ask them for feedback to hold me accountable. And so I think that intentional accountability is what um, develops really great relationships for us to, to better serve our community because they're our customers. You know, we, we really um, uh, are only doing as good of a job as, as what our community thinks we're doing. Okay, great. I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. We would want to keep Brooke longer than necessary. I do want to say that uh, I, I heard you earlier in your presentation, I, I believe you used the word love twice, right? Um, and uh, when I was starting my profession in the early to mid nineties, love was a taboo word for an educator. Um, you know, you, you don't tell kids you love them. So, you have to convey it. So it's, it's nice to hear you use that word. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much for this time. And um, I'll drop my email in here if anyone wants to connect. Yeah, and I think, um, too, just to that point, um, one of my goals is always to teach students how to um, radically love themselves and where they come from and who they are. And so that's really where it comes from. Because you can't give out anything that you don't yet possess. And so what does that look like to really um, like that reflection that stares back at you at the end of the day? So that's always a goal. Thank you.